So I'm very happy to interview you today, especially as you have interviewed so many spiritual teachers and masters from India, from Europe, from America, actually from all over the world. So I'm really looking forward to get the chance to interview you today. And for me, listening to these life stories always uh, has been a profound teaching because I find people who talk about their past, how they have uh, gone through a profound spiritual transformation, is actually like a profound teaching itself. So maybe you like to start with your first memories about your life path? So my first living memory was probably four years old. And I remember looking out of the window, out into the garden, and seeing a, a large owl sitting on the tree. And somehow, 71 years later, I remember this image strongly. So I think this was probably a surprise, but also it was somehow very touching. So it, we could say this was my first spiritual experience, perhaps. And the other spiritual experience that I remember is that in those days, the milk was delivered with a horse and cart. And one of the things I remember is I used to go out and I would scoop up the um, droppings from the horse and put them on my father's rose garden. So somehow, you know, since those days, I seem to have been destined for a spiritual life shoveling shit. <laughs> Anyway, so that's they're, they're basically my first memories. I was born in 1944, uh, pretty much at the end of the World War II. Mm. Um, through photographs, I can say that my mother was around 21 years old, rather lovely looking woman. I remember her very softly, soft woman, uh, quite emotional, I think. Well, I can say later I discovered she's quite an emotional woman, but I remember our first time together was very kind of lovely. So basically, after I was born, my father went back to Germany. He was a doctor in the British Army. And my mother was left alone with me, and she lived in a small cottage on a huge sandy beach. And this was chosen because it was a very safe place and also because it was within a bus ride of where my grandfather lived. And so um, in those days, my mother had some support from my grandfather and his wife. Um, and I was living with her in a very safe place. But somehow later, when I looked back on my childhood, I get a kind of overlay that um, perhaps there was some kind of fear. I had some kind of fear. And I think this must have been coming from my mother because when she was, uh, I think, 18 years old or 17 years old, she had lost her first husband. Mm -hmm. uh, his ship was torpedoed. And now my father was in Germany. And so probably she lived with a lot of daily fear. But between her and myself, I can only remember um, well, I don't really remember anything, but from the photographs um, and what they told me, I was a very happy baby. The photographs show me with blonde curls, looking pretty cute. And the story was that I was um, so much laughing and happy that I fell off the, the bench because I laughed too much. You know? so, so the images I've been told from my early time with my mother was... Uh, pretty happy, I think. Um, later, there was a, a brother, the next, I had actually two brothers, and uh, I think he's about three years younger, younger than me, so when I was about three, there was a, another baby, and later I could say I was quite jealous about him. Unfortunately, my parents didn't do a good job to integrate us together, and so I was left when I was older, feeling jealous towards him. So we didn't, um, didn't really become such good friends, although actually the photographs and memories are that we were all playing together you know, in a happy kind of way. 
then there was a sister, and many years later, when I was already a teenager, there was a young brother. Mm -hmm. So we were actually four children. Um, my mother was always at home with us. She was very much a mother, very much a housewife, very much a companion for my father. And my father was a doctor, actually a psychiatrist, and his life was somehow focused very much on pioneering work in that field of psychiatry. So he was constantly writing things, he published uh, 30 or 40 books, he traveled the world giving lectures, and uh, yeah, he was, uh, you could say, a busy man, um, living a fairly uh, family life. He didn't really go out with friends drinking beer or something like that. He was very much at home. He often came home at lunchtime, so we would have a kind of family lunch. Um, and in the evenings, he would come home and work in his study. So he would be around, but perhaps a little bit remote. Um, so the other thing I can say is that, that when I was a child, it was always to my house that the children wanted to come and play. Uh, my mother was very hospitable and friendly to the other children. So I, out of that, I can imagine I was basically a fairly happy child. And certainly I remember my childhood as, uh, as basically a happy childhood. Um, my father was actually Welsh, and so I inherited a kind of hot hotness or temper or whatever you, hot energy, kind of hot energy. And occasionally my father lost his bananas, particularly over my homework when I had been playing too much. My mother encouraged play, and my father encouraged homework. So there was a kind of conflict between them. And when I went too much into play, my father sometimes lost his bananas and uh, got quite angry. But basically was a very calm, kind of loving daddy, as I remember. Um, and then we had, my parents had moved to a, a very nice village where they had a very beautiful old house, the big garden. And in those days I was already a teenager and I can remember um, very often actually in the evenings, maybe at 11 o'clock it would start after the BBC News, talking to my father about, you know, about the world in general and uh, whatever topic I would ha have at that time. And we would talk until my mother would come down maybe two o'clock in the morning in her curlers and say, aren't you coming to bed? Something like this. Um, so I think I had a good relationship with my father um, and certainly he was a kind of wise man and I, I'm sure I benefited a lot from his wisdom. So this sounds all pretty happy. Was your school time also this happy? At the school I don't really have particularly nice memories except it was a mixed school, so half of the people were girls and half boys, and so that was, I think, a bit nicer for me. Um, I think from, from my nice connection with my mother, I had already got a nice feeling towards girls. And in fact, that's continued through my whole life, so that somehow I've spent more time with girls than I have with boys. Um, probably that started from this first few years when I was living just with my mother. Unfortunately, I, I didn't have much interest in learning to read, write, or do arithmetic. And the story goes that as soon as I discovered comics around that age, um, I taught myself to read in a couple of weeks. But basically, otherwise, I was completely not interested in all those sort of academic things. Um, so then my parents didn't really know what to do with me, so then they sent me to a traditional English, they call them public schools, but actually they're private schools. It was the best school available in the town, so in that way I have to thank my parents for sending me to have good education. But unfortunately, um, it was completely the wrong sort of academic environment for, for myself. And so although I was actually proven to be quite intelligent, um, I was always in the A, B, in the C stream, about halfway down the C stream because I used to just spend all the classes playing around. I was completely not interested, as far as I can remember, I was not interested in any of the classes. 
In fact, the only thing that I became interested in that I can remember was woodwork. And um, this was rather funny because somebody presented the school with their very biggest cup. Uh, and so although I couldn't run and I wasn't in the cricket team and I wasn't in the rugby team, I ended up winning the biggest cup in the school for building a little sailing boat. I built a sailing boat for myself when I was about 16, 17. Um, the other thing I was particularly good at was that we had a kind of, uh, we used to play army in the school. You know, we'd dress up in army uniform and we'd have to march around and we'd learn about guns and all this stupid stuff. But I was very good at shooting. So I was actually the, the, the number one uh, marksman in the school. And so I got a little credit for that. But of course, uh, shooting and woodwork were not the main mainstream in the school. And I was a kind of constantly a failure, I could say. All the way through my school time, I was a failure. Except that when I was, um, I think, 16 or 17, there was another exam. Actually, there was one at 16, another one at 18, two exams. They called O-level and A-level. And basically, I was destined to fail all those exams. But luckily, there was one teacher who took an interest in me, and I somehow responded to his interest. And like a miracle, I passed enough of those exams that I could go to university, which kind of defied everybody's expectations, actually. And did you enjoy your time in the university more? When I was, um, I don't know, 18 or 19, something like this, I chose to become a civil engineer. So I went to an engineering college in London and um, studied to be a civil engineer and actually a structural engineer. So civil engineer designs bridges and dams and earthworks and a structural engineer designs the structure of buildings and also bridges. And in my last year at university, I wrote a, wrote a brilliant letter, absolutely brilliant letter. It was the first time in my life I could say I was successful because in England there was a famous design office in London um, who, uh, for example, designed the Sydney Opera House, the structure of the Sydney Opera House. They also designed the structure of the Pompidou Centre in Paris, mm -hmm. two famous buildings. And so I was very attracted to that company and I wrote a very good letter and I got a job. And I remember on the first day sitting with the new boys and they were all coming from Oxford University or Cambridge University, which are the two famous universities in England. And I was coming from <laughs> Joe Bloggs University. <laughs> And uh, so that was a little bit, um, what's the word, I, I felt a little bit um, overawed by that. But actually in this company, they somehow liked me and I liked them. And actually I did very well. Um, I remember every year when they reviewed the salaries, um, I, they always gave me a big salary increase. And often I was going there thinking, well, maybe it's enough now. I think I should quit. <laughs> because I already started to feel that although I liked where I was working, I didn't really like being an engineer. And I remember going to meetings in the, in the Institute of Engineers and feeling like a complete fish out of water. And so it was gradually dawning on me that somehow this was not really my destiny. Um, but I didn't know what my destiny was. So every year when they gave me lots of extra money, I said, thank you very much and, and carried on for another year. Um, Finally, I couldn't carry on anymore. And so I, in fact, made a decision to go back to study and become an architect. So I remember on the final salary review meeting, uh, I went to the pub at lunchtime, had a couple of whiskies, uh, and then I told them I'm quitting, which was very, very difficult for me emotionally. And funnily enough, I remember existence has set up a little trick because I, I had a very old, soft Volkswagen Beetle, which I loved a lot. And I used to have it um, serviced in a garage where the owner had a red Porsche with black leather seats. 
and he was willing to sell me this Porsche. Mm. So I had basically the, the, the choice, you know, do I carry on working and then I can buy the Porsche or do I quit and then I can't buy the Porsche? So this was happening somehow around the time of this decision. And um, I must have not been an easy decision, I guess. I don't remember really. But anyway, in the end, I decided to quit, go back to architectural school. And this was a tremendous moment of freedom. When I first went to the architectural school, which was a very um, interesting school, a famous international school in London, um, where I met you know, interesting teachers, I met interesting friends, and spent every day in a kind of ecstasy of uh, interest. So I remember once walking down the street and vomiting. I was so excited and so happy with my life that I actually just spontaneously vomited in the street. Although maybe it was a good choice in one way, and my parents, of course, were very happy with the idea that I would be an architect and an engineer. So my mother was extremely happy with me and my father also. And it looked like I would become a very, you know, responsible middle class member of society. Everything was very good with the family. But somehow inside myself, um, probably I was about uh, 27 years old at that point, I was beginning to feel some strong inner feelings of discontent. And of course, I didn't really understand what that was. Um, in a normal sense, I wasn't unhappy. I had my Volkswagen, I had a nice apartment, occasionally I had a girlfriend, and um, I had some money um, from working in that company. So basically I was kind of happy, but on a deeper level inside, something was very disconnected, disconnected and discontented, I would say. So I had a kind of crisis but I didn't really know what to do about my crisis. I didn't know anybody who could help me. I didn't know what help I needed. Um, but gradually, in the next year or two, it became more strong. And at that point, I met some Japanese architect students at this college. And they invited me to come to Japan for three or four months in the summer holidays. And this seemed to be a great idea because it would be something completely new, you know, completely different culture and um, completely some new adventure, basically. I felt I needed an adventure or something like an adventure. And so um, I arranged um, a, a holiday job in an architect's office in Tokyo. I arranged to teach English in a language school. They provided me with an apartment and um, I remember having a, a kind of uh, immediately some kind of cultural um, uh, confusions. I don't know if confusion is the right word. And so I began to kind of compare being an English guy uh, with being a Japanese guy. That was the beginning of a kind of inquiry that happened. And after I'd been working for, I don't know, three or four months, I went on a trip around Japan, and then I was going back to England. But uh, during this trip, it became clear that I wasn't ready to leave. Um, Japan was a kind of challenge on the outside. Um, on the inside, I was being very confronted by the completely different uh, culture that I was living in. And somehow there was some kind of intrigue to understand more about this culture. By then I'd been um, in, interested in pottery. Mm -hmm. I was interested in um, uh, tea ceremony. I studied shiatsu. Um, and I was kind of interested in Zen. And I visited lots of Zen monasteries and temples as I was traveling through Japan. So I was kind of getting some sort of spiritual interest. And so in the end, I decided not to leave and go back to, 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 the, to the, the architectural school. I would stay a few more years. Well, I didn't say a few more. I would stay another year, I think, in the beginning. Mm -hmm. But then um, 
it turned out that um, I could get some very good jobs to teaching English in big companies um, because I was officially a student in Tokyo University. I was a research student in Tokyo University. And in Japan, uh, Tokyo University, mm -hmm. if you go to Tokyo University, you're like a god. You can open any door in Japan by saying, you know, you're from, uh, they used to call it Todai, which is this very famous university. And the boss of my uh, architectural company when I went to Tokyo, he was from that university and he arranged for me to be a student there. So this was very, very lucky because I was able to end up staying three more years, in fact, in Japan, where the professor would write a letter every year and I'd get an extension of my visa. So this was very, very nice because it also allowed me to meet all the famous architects of Japan, go and visit their buildings. <clears throat> so I met tons of interesting people in that time. Um, and at the same time, I was going through some very strong internal process. And um, I also met a, a woman. I met, well, I met a few women, but one in particular, Yoshiko. Um, became my wife and uh, we spent about 12 years together. She taught me about silence actually. So she was my kind of Zen master. She came from downtown Tokyo. She was a bit of a solitary woman. She was actually a fashion designer or clothes designer. A very um, particular girl. Um, she couldn't speak any English. I couldn't speak any Japanese. So we had a kind of interesting way of communicating um, through silence actually, through the language of silence. Existence basically uh, suddenly stepped in. So suddenly from you know, the right side of the stage, the stage of my life, existence stepped in. Because what happened was that I had gone to London or gone to England with Yoshiko. And I remember at the end of our time in London, probably a week or two, uh, we went to Paris, and the idea was we have a little honeymoon in Paris and then fly back to Tokyo. So that was the plan. <clears throat> and this is where existence absolutely stepped in and completely changed my life. Because what happened was that in, my, in, in the year before that, I had gone to meet a, an American... No, no, he was uh, a German. I went to meet this German professor from MIT in America an architectural professor who would talk to me about Japanese architecture. He was kind of expert on Japanese traditional architecture. So I remember I went to Kyoto from Tokyo. I went on the train to Kyoto to meet him. And when I got to the bus stop, there was a man standing smoking a pipe and he was wearing orange clothes and he had beads around his neck. And on the beads, there was a photo that looked like Karl Marx. I thought it was Karl Marx, but it turned out to be Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. And that night, instead of talking about architecture, we started talking about um, all kind of spiritual stuff. He was there with his Japanese wife, also wearing, I remember, an orange dress. And they had invited, or I had come with, I can't quite remember, there was a Chinese, young Chinese woman also there. So the four of us, I remember, we sat through the whole night and we were talked about chakras and meditation and spiritual masters and all this kind of stuff, which presumably I must have been interested in because we talked through the night. Then we went to sleep in the morning and um, in the afternoon when I was leaving, they wanted to play me uh, a little audio of Bhagwan. So they, they played it and they were very enthusiastic and they were saying, you know, you're absolutely ready now for this. This is your next step. You know, you have to go and visit him. And as they played this, I was going something like, well, he's got a horrible way of speaking English and I'm not interested at all. Completely not interested. I remember in those days I was wearing a little white suit with gold glasses with a little trimmed beard. You know, I was this sort of funny middle class... Uh, lost soul actually, kind of I was a lost soul in those days. So as you weren't really interested, how did you meet Osho? So then when we went to London, we went to Paris for our honeymoon, when we went to the airport to fly back to Tokyo, 
They announced at the airport that the plane was delayed. They put us in the hotel for the night. And the next morning, they gave us a new ticket, which was Air India. So we got on the plane. And when we got towards Delhi Airport, Delhi, I, I said to Yoshiko, well, maybe we just get down and have a few days holiday here. So that's what we did. In those days, you could just go and point to your suitcase and uh, you know, go, go, go off the plane at the wrong uh, <laughs> airport. There was no problem with security in those days. And so um, we got a guest house somewhere and um, we were in Delhi. And then I think in the next day or two, I went to the travel office to confirm my ticket to go back to Tokyo. And as we were talking, the man told me, well, you know, this is a regular ticket. This is not an economic uh, cheap ticket. This is a regular ticket. And if I calculate the mileage from London to Tokyo, you could fly all through India for free. So this was kind of shocking news. So I said to Yoshiko, well, we could do our honeymoon now. Why don't we do a three weeks honeymoon now? And we go back a bit later to, to Tokyo. So that's what our, we decided on that plan. We had a wonderful time, you know, traveling through India to all the tourist destinations. And finally, we got to Bombay. And when we were in Bombay, we remembered that the ashram where Rajneesh was and where my uh, uh, German professor friend, where he might be right now, was only a few hours on the train. So we decided to go and visit him. So I remember we arrived in the, um, what's it called, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh Ashram. And we came in and somehow it was, it was a very strong moment, I can say. It was a very strong moment because suddenly, spending a few days there, I started to feel very, very good. So this, these years of feeling uh, confused, feeling disorientated, feeling basically very unhappy, not having any idea what I wanted to do in my life. Suddenly, the atmosphere in this ashram um, was deeply touching me. Um, I would go to his morning discourses and he was talking about different spiritual traditions or different spiritual masters, um, all kind of stuff I'd never got involved with before. So this was very interesting. He was very charismatic. He was sitting on a, a simple stage in a white um, gown. And um, he told a few jokes. And uh, there was like a few hundred people sitting in front of him. And I found the whole thing very beautiful, actually. And then the people I met in the daily life of the ashram, I could sense very open-hearted people, a uh, very nice flow between the people. And so then I did a little bit of meditation, which um, I'd never done before. I remember the, the first time closing my eyes and I was supposed to keep them closed for an hour. And I remember sitting there with closed eyes thinking, well, what am I doing? There's such a waste of time. There's so many things I could be doing in this hour. So I was very mindy in those days. And I spent three weeks going around the ashram saying, why, 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 why? Can you explain this? Why, 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 why? So anyway, but out of all this, um, I think I did a workshop which gave me a taste of another way of understanding life. Probably Yoshiko was a very good support at that time because she had this kind of natural silence. Um, so probably it was easier for her than it was for me. And we basically decided, well, we'll go back to Japan. We'll work hard for a year, get married, and come back. So this is basically what we did. We went back to Japan. I worked all the time. I didn't do much study. I just worked to make money teaching English. Um, Yoshiko carried on with her job. When we got married, her father gave her the same amount of money that I had. So I think we both had a million yen, whatever that was. I don't know how much that was, but um, I remember a funny, funny thing because we were basically planning to travel back, you know, through India to England and start our married life. Yeah? So I remember we spent uh, some time buying all kind of pottery, 
all kind of Japanese kitchen stuff and loading up about 20 quite large wooden tea boxes with all our goodies. And we shipped these back to my brother's garage, actually in England, where they stayed for about 25 years, where we never, you know, we never started our family, happy family life with all this stuff because on the way back to Europe, we ended up spending, um, I can't remember now how long it was, but it was quite a long time in Osho's ashram, maybe a year and a half for me. I think she left a bit before me, so maybe it was a year for her and a year and a half for me, something like that. And basically I had decided to stay there. And that was the first of a couple of times when Osho, or three times actually, when Osho left me so I had decided I would stay in the ashram, even when Yoshiko uh, fell in love with somebody she met on the beach mm -hmm. and wanted to go and be with that person. I said, it's okay for me, you know, we'll stay friends, off you go and have fun. And I was in love with Osho, so I was completely contented. And so I decided to stay, she decided to go. It was very sort of energetic, but basically all right. Um, but then Osho left. You know, Osho suddenly flew off to America. One day we arrived in the ashram to be told that Osho had gone and that the ashram was closing. Osho was doing a, a tour around the world and after maybe two years, I think, he was going to Oregon and starting a big community in Oregon. I was faced with going back to England which was about six months after Yoshiko had gone back to Europe. So we met up again in London and um, started a new life together in London. So during that time in London, um, we needed to find a way of surviving. We had no money. Um, I had a nice apartment, which a friend had been looking after. So I was able to get my apartment back. So we had somewhere to live um, and we needed to create a, uh, some income. And so we decided, um, oh, I know how it started. So at the end of our street, there was a market every Saturday. And then Yoshiko had the brilliant idea, why don't we sell silk kimonos? Because she had a friend in Japan who could send kimonos to us. And after a time, we realized that the street market wasn't the right place to sell silk kimonos. <laughs> so then we started going to antique markets, you know, where kind of upmarket places in hotels selling our silk kimonos there. And then Yoshiko had a completely brilliant idea because in Japan, the working women in the fields used to wear uh, little baggy trousers and a little fold over jacket. And the fabric was indigo. It was natural indigo dyed fabric. And they dyed this in a, in a way that there was a pattern, a white, pattern on the blue and in those days you know jeans were like the hot thing and this was a sort of variation on jeans mm. so I remember one afternoon we went to this very famous boutique uh, to the buying office there was a woman there her name was Maureen and we had a suitcase and we took out our suitcase and she said okay um, I'll take the things I really like and I'll put them over there and basically, she took out everything in our suitcase and put it over there. So it, it was a kind of very energetic moment because basically she just loved the stuff. And before we knew what had happened, she'd put it in the window of her boutique. It was in the mag fashion magazines almost immediately. And, um, you know, kind of overnight, we had a hot business. And we created it um, with the help of this woman into... Uh, probably one of the strongest fashion statements of that summer. Mm. And after we conquered London, we then went to Paris, uh, Milan, um, other towns uh, in uh, Amsterdam. We traveled in a car all around Europe, basically, and we sold this stuff everywhere we went. So suddenly we found ourselves with an incredibly hot business. It was so hot that we hardly could have time to sleep, actually. So we made lots of money, we were very busy, um, but in the end it made our relationship very pressured. And also, I was beginning to feel that I missed Osho, you know, that I didn't really want to do this business anymore. 
I was still running around in orange clothes with a necklace, which was okay for the fashion people because they, they you know, they're used to funny people, so they could accept me okay. Um, so basically, at a certain point, we were very exhausted and we agreed one day, let's just stop. So basically, from one day to the other, we just stopped. Mm -hmm. And I said to Yoshka, well, I want to go to America. By that time, Oregon was busy and you could go and visit and stay there. So I said to Yoshka, I'm going to go to Oregon. She said, no, no, I don't want to come there. So it looked like we were going to separate. But then, uh, you know, maybe a week before I was leaving, she relented and said, I'll come too. <laughs> so we went together. Um, it was quite a exciting place, actually. There were hundreds, thousands maybe of people there. It was a, I think we went to a special festival where there were maybe 10,000 people. It was a, like a huge celebration. Um, and at the end of this celebration, I think I decided I wanted to stay longer and Yoshko decided to go back to London. So again, we separated. Anyway, after some time, um, Osho left again. It was the second time he left me. He, he left. Um, by that time, I'd become quite a good meditator. So that was very much my focus, that I would regularly meditate. Mm. Um, so I worked in the community there and also meditated. That was somehow my lifestyle. And then suddenly Osho left. This was when he'd got arrested and had to leave the country. So then the community collapsed. And at that point, Yoshiko decided to come and visit me. Mm -hmm. So that was quite nice. She came and joined me again. And our companionship, our love affair, whatever you call it, continued again. So we'd had already Twice, I think, we'd separated, and then twice we'd come together again. So we had a very strong bond. And ending up in a small town south of Los Angeles called Laguna Beach. Mm -hmm. That was probably where I had my first Satori. Actually, my first Satori happened on a family holiday when I was around 10 years old. Mm -hmm. So... Um, well, I don't know if it really was a Satori, but I had some kind of very strong spiritual moment where we were, we were on a family holiday. I was in the back of the car with my sister and brother, the three of us. Mummy and Daddy were in the front of the car. And we were right in the south of France, south of Arles, in, a, in an area of kind of half desert where they had these wild horses. It was famous, famous for white horses horses, wild horses. And um, I remember the car stopped and I re remember stepping out of the car and something happened. Like what I remember was a kind of moment of blinding light and um, not a clear memory really, but there was some kind of inner, something happened inside me, a kind of inner shock. I can't say I can't really use spiritual words for it because I was too young, I think. But it was like a, definitely something happened um, in a moment. And it was to do with the sun, the horses, the, the landscape. And maybe from coming out of the car, it was a completely different environment. I don't know, something happened. I think my mind stopped and I had some moment, kind of special moment. So I think that was my first Satori when I was about 10. But during the time I lived in this little town in California, I remember there was some hypnotherapy uh, training. I think it was a one month training. And I had a very nice connection with the man who was the hypnotherapist. He was one of the, the main Osho uh, therapist actually living there and we had a personal nice connection <clears throat> so I decided to do this workshop I don't know how soon but after maybe a week we had a day off and something happened on the beach we'd all gone down to the beach and something happened to me and the next day um, I didn't feel to go back into the workshop 
I remember I went and in, the, in the property where the workshop was, there was a little stream running through the property. And I had a strong feeling to just go and sit by the water. Again, I remember sunshine. I remember things like dragonflies floating around, butterflies. And I was sitting there feeling, oh, incredible mm -hmm. ecstasy. It was just like, wow, so much ecstasy, so much beauty. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And I don't know really, but I don't think my mind was functioning. And so I was basically in a very empty space, you could say. Maybe it was a Satori, I don't really know what happened. Mm. But as my memory goes, it was very peaceful, very empty and quiet. And I was very present with the beauty of the nature, you know, the sun on the water, the butterflies, everything was, was beautiful, very beautiful. And were you still together with your Japanese wife? I mean, could you share with her your spiritual path? By that time, Osho was now back in India, back in Pune, mm -hmm. and basically um, everybody was beginning to go back to India to be, be with him. And so um, Yoshiko and I decided we'd go back to London together, mm -hmm. and I had the plan that I would then go to be with Osho. Um, I think that's what we did. We went back to London and Yoshiko basically decided that she wanted to stay in London. She didn't want to come with me back to India. So we had this very strong period when it wasn't clear what was going to happen. Mm. And finally I made the decision that I have to go back to Osho. I have to continue my spiritual work. She wanted to stay in London and continue her designing, clothes designing work. And so basically we decided we'd separate. Mm -hmm. And this was really intense for me because I completely love Yoshiko. She was, I mean, it wasn't a normal kind of connection somehow we had. We were incredibly deep friends and um, she had very lovely characteristics. She had a wonderful heart. Um, she was kind of small, always dressed like an art gallery. She used to cook amazing Japanese food. I mean, no man in their right mind would ever leave a woman like that. <laughs> she was like everybody's dream wife, really. But I couldn't stay with her. So, I, I mean, I wanted her to come, but if she wouldn't come, I had to leave, basically. So I remember we got to our last night together. She was in bed asleep. I was sitting in the chair. And I did a very nice drawing. I've still got it. A very beautiful drawing of, of a seashell, or maybe two or three seashells. And... Um, I think this was symbolic of how I saw her, you know, she was like a little pearl in a way. I saw her always as a, like a little pearl. I think that was more or less the end of our living together relationship. We'd been together maybe 12 years. We're still friends now, you know, many years later we're still friends. So the connection never really broke, but you know, she made one choice, I made a different choice. So you told you had this lovely connection to your family. Did this continue? No, not really. I mean, my, my connection to my family was working until, <clears throat> basically until I went to Osho in, in when I was 30. And then I started getting letters from my mother saying, you know, what are you doing sitting in the sun doing nothing? Um, what about your life, you know? Uh, yeah, they, they couldn't really understand, actually. It was a bit surprising for me because my father, but in fact, both my parents had basically trained me to be a strange guy. <laughs> my mother had encouraged play and creativity. My father had encouraged things like, when I got to 18, he said to me, you don't come on the family holiday this year. Off you go. And I'm like, what? Can't come on the family holiday? And he threw me out of the nest, you know, he said, off you go. And I, I ended up hitchhiking around Europe for a month or two. So actually it was great. I had a great time, but I absolutely wasn't ready to not come on the family holiday, you know. So in that way, he was a very wise guy. But when I showed up, um, as I say, with a beard and orange clothes, somehow our connection started not really to work, you know. 
and that gradually got you know we got more and more disconnected I could say so that was uh, I mean, at the time, it was it was hard for me because I basically had very loving emotional connection to them both and to my brothers and sister. But somehow, this choice I made, it was a choice that I couldn't go back on. I couldn't compromise on. Mm. It got stronger and stronger, basically. And as I as it got stronger and stronger, somehow the emotional bond with my family gradually kind of ruptured, you could say, actually broke. Because you had a very clear priority, you left your wife and you also left your family behind, although you really loved them, what happened then? So, I mean, basically I've got to the time when I'd gone back to, to Osho, mm -hmm, when he came mm -hmm. back to India, mm -hmm. and I stayed there. Um, And I got involved with something that was called Tibetan pulsing, which mm -hmm. was a kind of energetic body work. And the man who had developed this was somebody I had met in California. And we had quite a nice um, kind of connection. And in fact, he always used to joke that he and I and one other guy, the three of us, had been pirates together <laughs> in a past life. So I always felt very welcome in this group. And gradually this group became uh, the biggest thing that was happening in Osho's ashram. Everybody was kind of getting involved in it. And because of my nice connection, I became one of the kind of assistants to him. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And out of that situation, I remember I met a, a Russian woman. And she, it turned out that she was um, a student at Moscow University in the psychology department. And so she wanted me to invite this man to come to the university and give a, a workshop. Mm -hmm. And when I went to him and suggested this, invited him, he said, no, you go. So this was a bit of a shock because I didn't feel in a way ready to go. But anyway, I decided I would go. But I arranged for an American man who had been a psychiatrist Uh, who was also one of the assistants, I arranged that he would come with me and he would do the workshop and I would be the assistant, <laughs> right? Because my confidence levels were still not very high in those days. But anyway, I got my visa and in the last minute he didn't come. So I arrived in Moscow. Um, I was met at the airport by this um, Russian lady. Um, and then I discovered that she hadn't organized anything in the university. And I was like a bit shocked, you know, because I'd gone through the process of getting a visa and, you know, mm. getting on the plane, getting there, and then nothing had been arranged. <laughs> Later I found out this is a sort of typical Russian situation. So actually what she told me was that she was invited to a meditation camp in the south of Russia, mm. in Sochi, where now they recently had the Winter Olympics and that um, there was a group coming from Germany and a group of Russians mm -hmm. and there would be a camp up in the mountains and if I liked I could come with her. So actually I didn't see I had any option really. <laughs> I was there and that was it. So I remember we got on the train and went all through you know, Russia, Ukraine, ended up at uh, Sochi, slept in the station that night and in the morning we met the groups And they'd arranged helicopters, big uh, army helicopters, which took us up onto a campsite next to a glacier high up in the mountains. Mm. But at the end of the group, what are we going to do? I had no idea what was going to happen. And then it turned out that... Um, ah, somebody had brought a letter from Pune with a new name for somebody in, who lived in a nearby town. So at the end of the camp, uh, two or three of us went to that town with the idea we would deliver this letter to somebody. Mm -hmm. But we didn't know where he lived. So it was a kind of strange situation. And I remember that um, basic existence took over because we arrived in this town. We were walking in the street and we met this guy in the street and gave him the letter. 
And of course, he was very touched. And it turned out he was a doctor in a hospital, in a big hospital, quite an important doctor. And we explained that we had the idea to offer a workshop. And he said, no problem, I can arrange everything. <laughs> so, you know, that was my first workshop. Um, I can't remember how many people, maybe not so many, maybe 30 people came. And we had a weekend together and we did meditations, Osho meditations. Um, I showed them how to do some of this Tibetan pulsing, this energy work. Mm. And uh, we did some sort of sharings. We had a very good weekend, I remember. And I don't know really what happened after that, but basically I continued doing those weekends for the next six months all over the Soviet Union. And I traveled with a little gang of close people. And um, it was a time when there was no food in, in the Soviet Union. The shops were empty. If any food showed up, you know, there would be a queue. <laughs> and, you know, so we used to buy our food from private markets. And um, I remember there was one young guy who used to carry the champagne. They had very good champagne, mm -hmm. very, very cheap. Nobody had the money to buy champagne. So we used to carry, you know, bottles, bottles of champagne. <laughs> And we basically lived on champagne and potatoes. That was our main diet, I think. It was a very amazing time because mm. gradually I found myself acting like a um, spiritual teacher, actually. Mm. We would have sharings where people would ask questions and somehow I, f I had answers. I never knew where the answers came from, actually. They were not like my answers. They were coming through. We did a lot of meditation. I was in a very nice, quiet space. And um, I, I talked, you know, but, but it never felt very personal. Mm -hmm. And um, very nice people came, very heartful, open people came. It turned out there was a kind of spiritual underground in the Soviet Union, unofficial underground, where they would copy spiritual books and pass them around, you know, photocopies. Mm. And somehow I, I somehow connected into that network. Mm. Was this before you met Papaji? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually it was just before, because when I came back uh, to Pune and met this man who said, go to Moscow, mm -hmm. by that time he'd been told some of the stories that happened in this six months where apparently I did outrageous things. And because of these outrageous things, he was very sort of pissed off. I don't think he was really pissed off with me, but he played out that he was pissed off with me. So I, was a bit dis I became a bit disillusioned with him and the fact that he was pissed off with me because I thought I did a wonderful job mm -hmm. there. And it always felt to me he was slightly jealous because uh, you know, I traveled all over the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. met many people, I was doing his work, but mm. um, you know, I'd gone from being an assistant to being almost a guru, and maybe that was a bit too too threatening in some ways for him. Mm. He was more having women around him, not having really men around him. So there seemed to be some kind of personal thing going on. And at that moment, I heard about Papaji. So basically, I was ready. Ah, oh, the other thing that had happened probably before I went to the Soviet Union, Osho had died. Mm. So that was a kind of very strong moment. It was the third time Osho left me, and this time it was final. I stayed actually one or two years more in the ashram. I felt myself in quite a good space. I felt I'd achieved a lot through my years of meditation. And then what happened in the Soviet Union seemed to confirm that I had kind of got to some understanding. So I was actually quite content, you know, I felt I was knocking on the door of enlightenment, you could say, something like that. Right? And then um, I think at that moment, um, people came from Lucknow visiting Papaji, and I, I had a very good feeling. They seemed to be very, become very open. There was a lot of heart, very happy heart energy. And um, I was very touched from that. And then a close friend came back and he tried to explain to me all about the I. He kept saying, this is very simple. Can't you see it? Can't you see it? 
Don't you see how identified you are with the idea of being somebody? Can't you see it? Can't you see it? And I completely couldn't see it. So I'd been with Osho for about 15 years. And of course, I'd gone through uh, a kind of transformation. And for sure, I'd become very quiet. I think I developed a good awareness to look inside. The workshops had helped me understand, you know, maybe childhood issues and such things. But I had never understood that the I was not real. Mm. It was never a question. So when this man came back from Papaji, he, he tried to show me that this I was an illusion. I couldn't get it, I couldn't get it. So I somehow felt inside me, I have to go and meet Papaji, mm. because maybe if I go there, maybe I can understand from him directly something that my friend kept saying is terribly simple, terribly simple. And later I could say, well, yes, it's terribly simple <laughs> when you understand, and when you don't understand, it's terribly difficult. Mm. But, but somehow after many years, and Osho had died, and two years later, in a way I think I was ready for some other step. Mm. How was your first meeting with Papaji? At that time, I had a Russian lover who I'd met in Russia and who had left Russia with me. Mm -hmm. Very juicy, rather beautiful woman. And we decided together we would go to Papaji. When we first arrived, we stayed in a hotel. And then uh, probably the next day, we rented a bicycle rickshaw and asked him to take us to Papaji's house. We didn't know exactly where the house was, but we knew the name of the area. It's mm. called Indira Nagar. Um, so anyway, he said, yes, yes. You know, he looked like he understood. So we s sat in this bicycle rickshaw. It was very hot. And for maybe half an hour, he pedaled up the main road and then went to this area where we told him we wanted to go. Yeah. And he started driving up and down the, road, the streets and we were kind of looking out for the house, but we didn't really know the address. And this poor man, he was sweating, we were sweating, <laughs> he was sweating, and I was getting really concerned about him because it was extremely hot and he was all the time pedaling and looking you know, weaker and weaker. And I remember at a certain moment I said to him, stop. I stepped off the rickshaw, I looked up, and on the gatepost it said Punja. <laughs> and I suddenly thought, huh? That mu must be the house. Punja is it his family name. Mm. And then I looked up, and there he was. He was walking down to the gate. I was walking towards the <laughs> gate, and we just met at the gate, as if it all been planned somehow. You know, it was just like an amazing meeting that had all been planned by the divine or something. Mm. And um, I was in shock. I immediately went into shock, of course. And he said things like, um, Where are, where's your luggage? And um, where are you staying? You know, the things like that, very ordinary things. And I was like, no, 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 don't worry about me. We can manage, you know. <laughs> I was like, suddenly I've met God and he's worrying about my luggage, something like this, you know. But anyway, so that was how we met, which was, of course, very, very beautiful. And then I think almost the next day, but it might have been a couple of days later, there was the Buddha's birthday. Mm -hmm. And somebody told me, if you like, you can go to Papaji's house. So this was also a shock because in my 15 years with Osho, um, there was never a question of you know, going to his house. There was never even a question of meeting him. I never met him in 15 years. He was far away, you know, from everybody. Osha never was social at all. So I thought, well, I we go to his house. <coughs> so this Russian lady and me, we went to his house. There was maybe 10 people in his small living room. He was sitting on a little platform. Uh, these people seemed to know him very well, so they were gently talking. Maybe there were some spiritual questions, I can't remember, but... I think it was more like gossiping together about people. You know, has, <laughs> has Fred arrived or when does she leave? That kind of talk. But anyway, 
Um, it was very nice, very lovely energy. I was very, I was completely touched to sit there because from Osho being always far away, suddenly I was sitting in the room with Papaji. And for some time that was very, very comfortable. And then being English, I started to think, oh, it's going to be lunchtime soon, maybe we should leave. We're not invited for lunch, I don't think. And at that moment, Papaji stood up and was walking out of the room, probably to go to the toilet. And as he passed me, he put his hand on my shoulder. And this was so beautiful because somehow immediately I got the feeling he's telling me I can stay for lunch. It was like a deep connection, really. And so we stayed for lunch, you know, it was kind of easy peasy. Did this deep connection continue? So I think my early days were very lovely because I was very open. I was very happy to meet him. And then at some point, I realized that actually it was very dangerous. That it was like going to the lion's den and uh, maybe I shouldn't be so much rushing into the lion's den because he might just bite my head off. <laughs> so suddenly the, the energy a bit changed, I would say, a bit changed. Mm. But anyway, um, in those days you asked him a question, you would write a question, a letter with a question. And I wrote, um, three questions over about three week period. Um, one of them was very, was a, I think maybe my first, I think it might have been my first or maybe it was the second letter. I wrote some kind of spiritual nonsense and then I asked him, could he tell me how I can get rid of my blocks? Because in, in Osho's ashram, there was a lot of talk about blocks that you would go to do a workshop, you know, and you would get rid of your blocks, the blocks being some kind of mindy structures. You know? And so I, I thought this is a very clever question. That probably was my first question. You know, can you tell me how to get rid of my blocks? And Papaji did a brilliant answer. He nearly killed me in that moment, actually, because he said to me, show me your blocks. And this was like the whole house fell down in that moment because, of course, I immediately saw that I didn't know what I was talking about. There wasn't any blocks. What are these blocks that I'm talking about? And so this was like a kind of shocking uh, energetic moment as if he was shaking the whole foundations of my house. But it didn't fall down in that moment. And then uh, a bit later I asked him another question. Uh, I had re written something which actually was from myself. Um, but he asked me, did you read this in a book? <laughs> and um, I don't know exactly how it went, but somehow in that sort of moment when he challenged me, um, my eyes went closed. <clears throat> something very strongly energetic happened and um, when I lo looked there was complete whiteout there was nothing there was no thoughts there was no me there was just it was just like walking in a snowstorm it was just all completely white there was nothing and I also discovered I couldn't open my eyes so it was very he, he did something or his energy did something which was very powerful. I was sitting you know, on the floor and he was sitting on a platform. Um, the, the rest of the people were sitting around. And um, I think after some time, but I've no idea how much time, he asked me some silly question like, where do you come from? You know, <laughs> what's your country? And then uh, I sort of struggled and managed to get my eyes open. And then um, I was completely like um, drunk, I could say. I was completely drunk. As if, you know, when you wake up out of sleep mm. unexpectedly, you feel very disorientated, something like that. You know? And uh, then he said, come and sit with me. So he kind of dragged me up and put me next to him on this platform with maybe 50 or 100 people in front. And um, I think he put his arm around me. I think I probably couldn't sit really. He, I was too kind of gone. So he put his arm around me. So there was this enormous feeling of 
of caring, something like caring, you know, that I was supported. I remember looking inside, well, anyway, my eyes closed and I was looking inside, and I became aware of, of a feather, and this feather was spiraling down inside a huge space, like slowly spiraling down in this huge space. He was probably joking and talking to me, and I don't know if I was replying, I can't remember. And after some time, uh, he asked my girlfriend to come and kind of get me, and she kind of took me back to the back where I was sitting, and I kind of slumped on the floor. And the meeting stopped, he stopped the meeting, and he got some people to sing bajans. And uh, this went on for some time, like a sort of celebration. And then at the end of the meeting, he went out. Oh, before he went out, he called me back. So I kind of staggered back to the front, like a drunk. And um, I remember he said to me, oh, well, you won't, be, you won't need to come tomorrow. But I didn't really register that, you know. He, but I heard him say it, you won't need to come mm. tomorrow. And then he went out of the room and everybody left. And I was left sort of on the floor there. Mm -hmm. I was like a bag of potatoes on, sitting on, lying on the floor, actually. And I remember my lover and a few friends came around me. They kind of held my hand, um, held my legs maybe, and I was kind of sitting there with these people. Then somebody brought me a chai. There used to be a chai waller outside the meeting. Somebody brought me a glass with chai in it. And I remember holding this in my hand, you know, and, and looking at this chai, and I became completely fascinated by the texture of the surface of the chai. You know, I got kind of lost in this moment with the chai. You know? And there was another moment where I remember suddenly there was like a flash, and I felt this enormous love. I felt like I was trekking through the universe or something, you know, it was like enormous energy went out. Mm. Something like, Phew. that was also happening in one moment. Yeah, I think I was just there for some time, I don't really remember exactly, but these people who were close to me, they took me in a rickshaw back to where I was living at some point. He'd sparked something very powerful, actually. So I think every day there was this very powerful um, energy going on, energy phenomena going on, which I completely didn't really understand. Mm -hmm. So I, I went to the next meeting, I went to the whole week of meetings, and at, after about a week I went, I wrote something to him, I don't remember exactly. I remember at that time my, my I looked like uh, an alien from another planet, mm -hmm. I had these huge eyes, huge, and um, Everything was a bit unreal, uh, very quiet, very uh, empty, you could say. And it was very nice because he had an Indian, a close Indian friend, and every few days he sent this man to kind of check on me whether I'm okay. So that was a very nice feeling that he was kind of looking after me mm -hmm. somehow. Yeah. And um, so after a week I wrote him this kind of report about what was going on. He came and sat in front of him. And he started talking about snakes. Because in India, they, they build a house, they build, they leave out bricks near the ground mm -hmm. um, to let the snakes come in and out. So this is basically a story about doubt. He was basically saying, you know, don't have any doubts. But I couldn't understand what the hell he was talking about. He was going on and on about these snakes coming in the house, you know, don't allow snakes in the house or something. Mm -hmm. So I didn't understand anything about what he was talking really. It was complete like mumbo jumbo to me. But, um, but anyway, I, I felt uh, tremendously uh, kind of on fire, I would say. I felt a bit like I was on fire, something like on fire, but in a very silent, quiet way. <clears throat> and this went on at least for a month pretty strongly, where it felt like a, like like I had a, a washing machine going on inside. Everything was churning around. Um, everything was a bit unreal, a bit strange. 
and everything that I'm doing feels somehow removed in some way of some sort of distance from something that's inside which doesn't change. So there's kind of actions happening on the outside, but on the inside there is some kind of space which now has become very, very friendly and very, very close to me. And that space doesn't seem to change whatever is happening. If I was looking at the camera now, and if I was really talking to somebody who is back in the world, then I would say to them that um, it was all worth it, you know, it was all worth it. I don't remember now when it happened, whether it was during that first month or a bit later, but I remember one lunchtime, um, I was sitting with this lover, and suddenly there was like a bolt of energy came from me to her. Like, poof. and then she went into the same kind of strange space. She also looked like an alien. And I remember that we spent the afternoon together. I was kind of caring for her. And finally, I was so concerned, I took her to Puppage's house. And she had these big eyes like I had. We were like kind of alien couple or something. Mm -hmm. And um, and he said something like, oh, it's fine. You know, bring her to the meeting tomorrow. And then he, her name was Jaya, which means victory. And next day when, we, when I took her to the meeting, he gave her a new name, which was Vit Jaya, which means ultimate victory. Mm. So this was very, very lovely. Mm. But actually, at that time, our relationship had begun to crumble. She would go back to Pune and get our belongings. And I would wait for her to come back. And somehow, when we were saying goodbye on the train, my intuition told me she's not coming back. And sure enough, she didn't come back. And so I rented this house and w with a friend of ours, we stayed in this house. And this was quite interesting because the friend was a rather beautiful young Italian girl who'd been my lover's friend. And now suddenly we were living in this house together. Mm. It was very, very hot. So naturally you would be naked. You know, it, was, it wasn't a big thing to be naked because it's so hot. And I remember we used to sleep together in the, in the bed, together, naked. I was very attracted to her. She was absolutely beautiful. But there was no sex at all. No sex happened. And I discovered I couldn't be sexual. It was like the plug had gone out of my sexuality. Perhaps it was the first time in my life when I really discovered a different relationship where sex wasn't part of it. And I also discovered that actually women rather like this kind of sexless energy. And so actually I, I didn't have any sex for a year and a half or maybe two years. And it wasn't a decision, it was just that the plug had gone and I couldn't do it. I mean, the penis just didn't work. It was like a, you know, a wilted banana, you could say. Yeah. So this was also very interesting and this came out of what happened to me. So this must have been a very intense time in your life. After this thing happened and my girlfriend left, um, she didn't come back with our belongings, so I had to go and get our belongings. So I went down to get our belongings and uh, came back. And then the question in a way was, what am I going to do? Mm. So before I left, I, I met Papaji and he told me, when you go to get your things, go to Ramana Ashram. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I also thought to go to a few other ashrams. No, 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 just Ramana Ashram. Mm -hmm. So I went to Ramana Ashram and, uh, and then came back to Lucknow. And he had suggested that I run a guest house. So at that time, most people stayed in hotels. But as the numbers were getting more, there was the idea that people who wanted to stay longer, they would run a guest house and make a little income so that they could stay there. So I rented a very nice new house, nobody had lived in it, from a very nice man. Um, and uh, I ran a guest house, nearly for four and a half years I think I ran this guest house. And um, I thought it was about making money to stay there, mm -hmm. but after some time I, I would get into all kinds of different stories with the guests. And gradually I realized that I was living in a kind of laboratory. 
and each guest was bringing me some kind of experiment. And this experiment would show me uh, some kind of structures, mind structures. And it was a very interesting time because the identification with I had been cut. So these things were happening, but there was nobody to get emotionally dramatic about them. You know? So it was very easy to observe these different aspects. Mm. Like one guest would arrive, and the first thing he would do is to spend an hour to put all his clothes neatly in the, in the, in the shelf, in the cupboard. Yeah? Another guest would arrive, just bonk his suitcase in the middle of the room and disappear for hours. And I would have all kinds of judgments about these people and what they were doing. You know? And so it gave me an amazing chance to um, somehow understand myself, you know? so understand what was going on, what was inside me. And I mean, I'd done some of that in Pune, of course. I'd done workshops there. But this was a bit different because um, there was not this identification working. So it was almost like I'm watching somebody else. What's mm. going on with somebody else? Mm. So it was actually very easy to watch. Mm. So mm, gradually, you know, I had all kinds of adventures with the guests and uh, I learned all kinds of things with the guests. I had a cook who came and cooked in the evening. We had a dinner in the evening with about uh, 15 guests, maybe 20 guests. Um, I used to host it every night, you know, when we talk about whatever. And did you have closer meetings with Papaji during this time? Well, I, yes, I mean, there are a few stories I could tell, of course. Um, there was one story where um, at some point I got the idea that when Papaji leaves his body, we should have some kind of trust or foundation to look after his material. So this was something I was sharing with people. At that time, I ran a bookshop with his books and Ramana Mahesh's books. And out of that space, I had this idea that we should create a foundation. I was kind of putting it out, you know, canvassing for this idea. And so I'd gone to his house to ask him if it was okay, which basically was to show no interest. So, but then it suddenly he said to me, can you bring your cat? Because he'd heard that I had a cat, or two cats actually. I said, Papaji, why do you want me to bring my cat? It's only got one eye. I've only got a one-eyed cat. No, 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 bring your cat tomorrow, bring your cat. We've got lots of uh, mice in the house. We need a cat. So, okay, and, you know, I put the cat next to lunchtime. I put my, the cat in a bag, you know, and took him to Papaji's house. He invited me into his bedroom. He sat on a chair, I sat on the floor, and we let the cat out of the bag, <laughs> and he ran around the room, you know. But then he started talking to me, and gradually it dawned on me that he was the cat and I was the mouse. And basically he wanted to tell me to drop this idea that I had about the foundation. How he did it, I can't remember, but it, out of the meeting it was absolutely clear that he taken me into his bedroom to tell me, drop it. And the way he did it was with his cat. And he kept the cat for a few days. I don't <laughs> know if anything happened with the mice, but anyway, he kept the cat. But that was a sort of very, in a way, beautiful Papaji story. Um, you know, I was there for five years, so I've got, you know, quite a few stories. Mm. Another very beautiful story was that, um, <coughs> I decided I'd like to make a book because um, there were many people having this realization moment or Satori moment and he would always invite them next morning, okay, tell us, tell us, tell us the truth, you know, t talk to us from truth and nobody could do it, everybody was just silent. And sitting in the audience, I thought, hmm, how would it be if I interviewed them? And I came to them or came to that moment from different directions. Probably I could get them to talk about it, I thought. Yeah? So I started interviewing all these people. Like the day after they'd had their Satori, I would go and interview them with a camera. 
and I was gradually collecting all these interviews mm -hmm. and I had the idea I would make a book. And so I wanted to ask Papaji, you know, is it okay, you know, do you like this idea? So I went to his house, I had an appointment to go to his house, and I remember we sat together, he had the living room and, and two bedrooms, and in between there was a little hallway with a bench. Mm -hmm. We sat together on this bench, <laughs> um, and again I was feeling like the mouse with the cat, you know, it was like pff, pretty hot. And I was trying to explain my idea for the book. And once again, he showed zero interest, no interest at all in my project for the book. But then he suddenly started getting a piece of paper and he drew out the cover of a book, which was Day to Day with Papaji, which is a famous book from Ramana. Mm. And then suddenly he wrote John David on the bottom. <laughs> so it became clear he wanted me to make this book about him. Yeah. So this was completely shocking because one minute he showed no interest in my book and then suddenly he was inviting me to do this other book. But he didn't really make it clear how I was going to do this book. And then I was informed by the satsang organizer that the idea was that I would sit close to him, actually on his left side. Somebody sat on his right side recording the meeting and I was getting to sit on the left side of him in such a position that I could see all the people that came to talk to him. And then at the end of the meeting, I got all the letters. So this was pretty amazing because I experienced the whole satsang very close. And then I got all the letters. And out of this, I was supposed to create a book because of day by day was basically somebody remembering, you know, what the teacher said. And of course, I couldn't remember what Papaji said, but I had all the tape. I could have had all mm. the tapes. Uh, I can't really what, remember what happened with this project, but basically um, I was also supposed to write to people who he'd written to and ask them to send their let his letters back so I couldn't you know, publish all these letters. Mm -hmm. But actually I never got it together. I don't know why I didn't get it together, but I didn't get it together. I think it was never really clear what I was supposed to do and probably... Um, I don't know. But anyway, for many months, I had this special seat. And it occurred to me at a certain point that I was in a kind of apprenticeship, actually, because it's very beautiful to watch the kind of expressions on people's face as he would talk to them. Mm. You know, I would see these sort of satori moments kind of like erupting in front of me, mm. you could say. Yeah. So that was a very beautiful kind of thing, which again came very unexpected out of me asking for him to bless my project <laughs> and him giving me this other funny project and then getting a seat next to him. Mm. So those kind of things happened. I mean, I was felt quite connected, very connected, I would say. But I never really spent time in his house. There was a group who used to go every night for dinner. I never went because I was the host of my, in my own house. Mm. I didn't feel the need to go there because I felt very connected. Mm. So I basically would stay at home and be the host of m mm. in my guest house. Mm. You know? So I didn't go every night to his house. But those kind of moments that I've just described, I mean, there are other ones I could tell. I mean, we, we, we had, I think, a very good connection, actually. Mm. And I would say I still have a good connection. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And how did Ramana enter your life? Was it through this visit to Ramana Ashram? Actually, uh, he came into my life when I was still with Osho. I had rented some old rooms in a, in a palace, in a Maharaja's palace. And when I came to live there, there was a big pile of rubbish in one of the rooms. And in it, there was a picture of a man, naked, with beautiful eyes, wearing diapers. And I thought, oh, it's very beautiful, beautiful photograph. And I put it behind the cupboard but I didn't know who it was. And I, I don't know what happened really, but gradually it came out from behind the cupboard, got a new frame, it went on the wall. Somebody told me it was, this is Ramana Mahashi, a famous Indian saint. And gradually I found out he had a teaching, who am I? So I was kind of interested, but not very interested. Mm. And then when I went to Papaji, Papaji had a big picture of Ramana Mahashi on the wall behind him. And when he came in, he would namaste every day to this picture. And he would tell us, I'm just a channel for Ramana Mahashi. Mm -hmm. 
And so then when I went to his ashram, there was a stronger connection. And later when Papaji had left his body and I came back to India, um, somehow Ramana Mahashi by then had become even more strongly inside me. And now in January, I'm going to take my students for the 20th retreat in the town where Ramana Maharshi's ashram is, just, just a few minutes from his ashram. Mm. And so basically every year I re-establish a deep connection to Ramana Maharshi. Mm. Yeah. Were you in Lucknow when Papaji left his body? No, actually, um, I think about a year before he left his body, I got this voice inside me, actually for a whole year, so it must have started about two years before he left his body, I got this voice inside me, like a message, saying, cello, cello, means go away, go away. And so I sort of resisted it for a whole year. I didn't want to go away. I couldn't really go away. I felt so connected, there was nowhere to go. Mm. And then uh, finally, um, I remember I had rented out the house to a man who was going to look after it. Um, and then he gave up the job. And so I had to give up the house and I had to leave, basically had to leave. So I left, went to Australia, a country I didn't know, and ended up, after many adventures, I ended up in Sydney. No way, no way of making an income. I, ah, I decided I would teach Reiki. Somebody had made me a Reiki master, so I started teaching Reiki. And then the man in the center where I taught Reiki, he wanted somebody to teach meditation. So I started doing Reiki and meditation. And then after some time, I found another center and then another center. So I was teaching in three different centers, which gave me enough to live on. I used to go out of Sydney to a small village called Pearl Beach, the beautiful little holiday village on the, on the beach. And we would have a, a weekend Reiki retreat, maybe once a month, something like that. And uh, on that particular weekend, I remember one lunchtime, the, the, the Saturday lunchtime, I'd gone for a walk alone. I'd looked at a sign, a street sign. I can't remember what it said, maybe Crystal Avenue. There was some word anyway that triggered something. And I got this message like a, busy fax message started coming through, basically saying something like, you've got some work to do, blah, blah, blah. You know, I can't remember now what it said. I was a bit surprised and uh, it went on for the whole weekend in different, different aspects of a message. And um, I didn't give it very much attention. And then maybe three or f around three weeks later, a, a friend came with a little a nice little sachet to put around your neck. And she said, this is Papaji's ashes. And I said, ah, when did he leave his body? And then we got the date. I figured out the date of this message and it was exactly the same moment. So this funny message came exactly when he left his body. Mm. And so then I took it kind of seriously. I thought, well, maybe I have to do something. I remember I was having a holiday up the coast and it was close to where uh, Isaac Shapiro lived, who's going to be in this book. So I went to his house and said, look, I got this strange message. It seems like I have to take it seriously. I'm teaching meditation, Reiki. Uh, what, do I, what do you think I should do with this message? What, what kind of work is, what sort of work am I meant to do? And then he talked about satsang because he'd already for some years been offering satsang meetings. So he said, why don't you invite a few of your students and start a different kind of meeting? And that's what I did. And that's how it started. Mm. We started in somebody's living room and within a month, let's say, quite quickly, I had a building, half a building in the middle of uh, uh, Sydney. I had about 40 students coming to my meetings and it was all kind of like unbelievable. <laughs> you know, there was like this energy phenomena happening. Mm. And then my, my father had his 80th birthday, and so I decided for three weeks I would go to England. So I didn't know what to do with this very energetic situation. 
And so I arranged somebody I knew from Lucknow to kind of take over as a substitute teacher while I went away. And when I got back, he'd convinced half of my students that he was a much better teacher than me. You know. So I kind of came back to a rather tough situation. And um, I don't really remember. I mean, I carried on teaching and uh, probably I gathered other people. I, I don't really remember what happened. Mm. And then at some point I got the message to leave um, Australia. I found myself deciding to have a, 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 like a year's retreat near the Ramana Ashram. I rented a nice apartment there and um, lived by myself, very quiet, and going to the ashram, sitting quietly. And then um, I remembered a message I had got one morning at breakfast in Lucknow. So about 10 years before, because I spent five years in Australia, um, I got a message one morning that I should go and film the Indian masters before they pass away. Mm. And this was this kind of incredible message because I wasn't a filmmaker and I didn't know who I should go and film. And so basically for 10 years I did nothing. And then when I found myself living in India for that year, um, this project came back and I started doing the project. I mean, basically, I made a list of 12 questions and I decided I would ask each master those same 12 questions. And after a few years, I had interviewed 16 masters and I published a book called Blueprints for Awakening. So each master basically gave his blueprint how you could become awakened or enlightened. Mm. And I made a film of that. I mean, each interview I filmed and we made that into a film. So it was a film and a book. And it took a few years to do the interviews, but it was a very beautiful time because it was somehow very energetic meetings happening with these masters. Um, many of them became sort of friends or colleagues or inspirations, I don't know the right word, but we had very nice connections. And so I would go back each year I had my retreat, I would put everybody in a bus and we would go on a sort of spiritual bus journey and visit some of the ashrams and some of the masters. Mm -hmm. So this was actually very nice for a few years. Uh, but of course then they started dying, that was the original message was before they die and they were all starting to die. So now we don't have any masters to go and visit anymore. Um, but anyway, out of that project, I also got the idea, or I was given a message probably, to do European masters. So I did another book and film about European masters. Mm -hmm. So this is actually a great blessing in my life because through the interviews, I shared very intimately and very intensely with 30 or 40 masters. Mm. And they're still, I still have a nice connection with most of those people. So that was something that, in a way, touched me a lot and supported my own sharing. Mm -hmm. How did you eventually get back to Europe? It was interesting. I came from India finally. Mm -hmm. It felt like the time, you know, it's time to come back to, to Europe. But I didn't know where I was going and my parents weren't interested in me coming to see them. And at that time I met a French woman. Often in my life women have kind of played a part in the next step. So she said, oh, I've got a very nice friend in Germany, in Wuffenbuckel, Buckel. <laughs> and we're a small town in the north of Germany, in a forest. He's an alternative doctor. You can go and stay in his house. He has a very nice house. I'm sure he'd love to have you staying with him. So I went there, she came there too, and we started having meetings in his house. And... Um, Somehow my destiny was set again. I arrived with a big suitcase, minus $5,000, <laughs> and no future at that moment. I mean, mm. I didn't know what I was going to do, really. But almost the day before I left India, I met somebody in the street who lived in Leipzig in Germany. And he, I told him, you know, I'm going to Germany. You know? And he said, oh, if you go to Germany, get in touch. I'll arrange a meeting for you. So that's what happened. After I'd been in the doctor's 
place for a while. And uh, finally, this man from Leipzig invited me to Leipzig. And out of Leipzig, I was invited to Dresden, from Dresden to some other place. And I think about eight months, I was traveling nonstop from town to town. At that time was a hot interest in satsang. Magazines had written all about Papaji and there was a lot of interest mm -hmm. in satsang, the word satsang. And um, yeah, I, I, I had an amazing time actually meeting lots of new people. Often people who didn't seem to have a spiritual connection with any teacher, which was a bit surprising because Germany had many, many teachers traveling around. And sometimes I thought, well, what is my role? What, what have I come here for? Because there's already so many teachers. But anyway, as I say, I met people that didn't particularly have a teacher. And then I remember that I had gone to a festival. It was a big spiritual festival in those days in Baden-Baden. It was called the One Spirit Festival or the Rainbow Festival, I think. And um, I think it was my first year there I was completely unknown, so they had given me a fairly small room. Uh, it was very hot, I remember. And this room got completely packed, and they were all out in the corridor outside. We left the door open. They were all kind of, the overflow had gone out of the, the small room into mm. the corridor. And at the end of the meeting, I was kind of exhausted because it was very hot and there was all this energy. And a man with a beard, looking a lot like a Sufi master, came to me and invited me to his farm. He said, you know, you look like you might like a rest. Come to my farm for a few days. So after the festival finished, we got in the car, went to his farm. Um, he was at Osho Sanyasin, and he built a big meditation room in his farm. It was one of these big old farmhouses. On the ground floor, he had horses. It was a horse farm. He looked after people's horses. And on the first floor, he'd made this meditation room. And then there were other levels with other rooms and things. And um, he said, well, you know, come and use my meditation room. I said, well, that's very nice. I said, I don't know, really. Um, I don't know, you know. I said, we, we have arranged to rent a house in the summer, to have a retreat in the summer. Maybe we could do the retreat here in your farm. Oh, yes, yes, he said, yes. He made some alterations so that it would be more workable. And we decided to come there. I said, don't worry, don't worry. There'll only be probably 20 people. I'm not very known. And then uh, we came there, I think it was for two weeks. And over the two weeks, 50 people showed up. It was very energetic. Everybody was very happy with what happened. And... Um, at a certain moment, people said to me, why didn't you ask him if we could live here? We could make a community. I hadn't thought of that, but I thought, well, that's okay. That's, I'm open for that. So I went to the farmer and said, you know, some people really like it here. How about if we come and live here and make a community? Sure, yes, do it. <laughs> I didn't know it, but at that time, he'd fallen in love with one of my students. So he was more than happy that we would come and live there. Um, so he said yes, and we started a community. Well, we didn't really start a community like that, but we had a meeting. I said, okay, let's have a meeting about it. So we, everybody who wanted came to the meeting. Most of the people came to the meeting. I said, okay, if you're interested in this community, sit on that chair and tell us your interest. And about 25 people sat on the chair and said they're interested to come. So we set a date, you know, you can come from this date. And I think, um, I think nearly everybody came. I think we had about 20 people quite quickly. And uh, a lot of the people had children, so it was very, very energetic, mothers with children and so on, mm. living on his farm. And uh, there were beautiful horses there. So we helped him clean the horse stables as a kind of rent, as a kind of payment to be there. He became one of my students. Mm -hmm. And for two years, we had a community there. Wow. And meanwhile, I would travel around Germany and Europe, actually, giving these mm. meetings every night in different towns. Mm. 
And then I would get in the car and show up there and maybe have a weekend there. And we kept this going for two years, a very energetic wow. time. And did your wife from Australia support you? Ah, yes. So I had met a woman in Australia. I'd separated from the Japanese wife and then I'd gone back to India. Then I'd gone to Australia and met a, after some time I met a wo an Australian woman, Carly Davy, uh, Sally. And uh, <coughs> uh, she had a teenage daughter. So when I was deciding to come back to Europe, she couldn't come with me. She'd agree with her daughter that she wouldn't come until her daughter was, I think, another year older or two years older, I can't remember. So I came to Europe alone and then she came a little bit later and then she became somehow the organizer of the community and she stayed in that role for a few years and then she said, John David, I've had enough. I've had enough of you and I've had enough of the community. I'm going back to Australia. I want to be with my kids. She had a boy and a girl and um, she wanted a different life, basically. So, um, so she left and um, I, th I think we had just moved to Hitok. We just moved to where we are today when she left. She stayed here maybe one or two years and then she left. And then, of course, you had come around that time somebody who was kind of a beginner, somebody who didn't really understand so much about what we were talking about, but had a deep kind of energetic connection to the community. And you arrived and gradually became the organizer. So I lost my left hand and got a new right hand, something like that. Yeah. So now we've been in this hit off a building, 17th century mansion. We've been here now for 13, 14 years. But in the process, we've got a very beautiful group of people who are very connected to Papaji, very connected to Ramana, and can very connected to each other. And over all these years, we've established a very deep silence. I don't know if that's the right word. I mean, that's one aspect of the word. And the other aspect is that there is a, what Osho used to call a Buddha field. We, I wouldn't really use that word, but everybody who comes to this house or this community feels that there is a kind of energy field here, which often they call love, that there's a great love here. Um, so this, this is something that has been created together over many years. Um, quite a lot of people have lived in the community, some of them staying you know, a few years and passing on. Other people have now been here for almost the whole time. Uh, two or three people have been here uh, maybe 12 years, something like that. Um, and we've established a very strong bond together and we have a lot of fun together. I mean, we work very hard to support ourselves. Um, we run a guest house, we have a, a seminar business, a massage business, and then we have an art gallery and a publishing company, which don't make money for us, but we put a lot of energy into them because we, we love beauty and love having exhibitions of beautiful paintings. And books, we published about 30 books in four languages, and we have made about eight films to do with the topic of truth, different aspects, you could say. So the publishing company is gets a lot of the energy of the community, and um, Today I'm talking for this new book, uh, Meetings with Remarkable People. And this, in a way, comes out of our community energy. Uh, a lot of people in the community are supporting this book, this project. And also it comes out of the fact that over the last years, I've met all these masters along the way. And out of those meetings, I've selected some people to go in this new book. So you have three communities, one in Hitov in Germany, and one in Trepilia in Ukraine, and another one in Denia in Spain. And a lot of teaching is actually happening through these communities. Can you maybe say something about this? Yeah, I mean, in the end, the teaching is the life. Mm. 
it's not separate from the life, you know. I mean, when I first started my spiritual work, I had a kind of concept that if I would understand certain things, I would become kind of spiritual. And maybe if I did certain things, like not eat meat, eat tofu, uh, meditate in certain ways, if I did those kind of things, I would also become spiritual. But now, I think years later, I have a different idea about all that. And now it's more about living the moment, living the moment now. And it's not so easy to live the moment now because we have a kind of weight of beliefs, we have a weight of ideas, how we got brought up in our family, in the, in the particular country, the culture. We have a weight of ideas spinning through our mind and therefore we are kind of living in a movie, a movie of all our ideas and beliefs, concepts and so on. And this separates us from the moment. Mm. And so in a way what we're doing in this community is that I'm pointing, when people get caught up in their movie, I'm pointing to not be caught up in your movie. Just be present. Do what existence is showing you is your next step, is your next moment of your life. And there is nothing special, nothing like some special thing called enlightenment. Nothing is going to happen like that. You've already, you're already special. You've already, you're already enlightened if you want to say it like that. And the problem is that there is so much between your true nature, the enlightenment, and the way you're living your life. You know, it's like looking in the open sky and in the open sky there can be clouds and those clouds prevent us having an intimate connection to the open sky. And so in a way the message is when those things, when the clouds appear, you need to be aware and in the daily functioning, everything in the daily functioning is going to show you your particular clouds. Mm. And those particular clouds are not so particular, they're a bit common to most people. And somehow by living together, we're constantly acting like mirrors to each other. So I have formal meetings where I talk in a more intense way to somebody, but I would say the teaching is happening in our community through the daily work mm. that we've chosen to do to support ourselves. Mm. So it's a very intense kind of teaching that goes on <laughs> 24 hours every day. Mm. Uh, and this, of course, is not for everybody, such an intensity. Um, and so we've been a community of 20 people, plus we have maybe another 20 or 30 people who come and visit occasionally. I call it a Sangha group, you know, it's a little bit wider group who don't want to live here but they like to come here regularly. Um, I have retreats where those people come and also mm. um, people I don't know suddenly show up. So there is uh, different mechanisms for me to meet and share with people. And um, I like to put people in touch with Ramana Mahashi's question, who am I? Mm. I like to put people in touch with opening their heart. Um, we have mantra singing, for example, which gives a kind of uh, opportunity to open the heart. Um, and then, of course, people are invited to be a volunteer in the house to experience this day by day kind of teaching where you yourself can see into a mirror. Mm. So if you're working in the kitchen, you know, somebody will say, we should cook this, and then somebody else says, no, I want to cook that, and then, you know, whatever, something happens. Mm. You know? And this is, if you're really aware and if you're open, you can quite easily see gradually your own uh, mind patterns, mm. the patterns that keep you away from the open sky. And this is what, in a way, I was doing in Lucknow with the guest house. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize in the beginning, Papaji said, run a guest house <laughs> for my, for my uh, people, he said, you know, run a guest house for my people. And then later I realized it was a lot to do with 
something for myself to get clear of my inherent uh, clouds you mm. could say mm. and that's what I continue to do in this community mm. I mean I could mention perhaps one last thing because now I'm 75 and I can see that I'm moving into the kind of winter of my life um, and quite consciously five years ago I had destiny had taken me to Ukraine taken me to the old capital of Ukraine I know the old it was the old capital of Russia actually but it was in Ukraine a kind of historical town and I was invited to give a meeting there and on the second evening I was inviting people to come and talk to me various people came and one young woman came and told me that she found my meeting the same energy as her home and of course that was a bit interesting a bit unusual for somebody to say that and later when a whole group of people had taken me out to a cafe it turned out that her father her stepfather actually had been a Russian satsang teacher so when she was a teenager she'd seen this film blueprints for awakening which I made with her mother when she was a teenager so she grew up in a family where the spiritual spiritual interest was quite strong and she'd come to this meeting I'd actually met her stepfather in, in, in Russia we'd had tea together some two years before and in that two years tragically he and her mother had eaten mushrooms and they had become poisoned from these mushrooms so she'd gone through this terrible tragedy of losing both her parents and some friends had said, you know, go to that satsang, go to that meeting, there'll be a good energy there, it'll be good for you to go there. And out of coming to this meeting, we became very connected. And after some time, she came to visit our community in Germany. Um, and we arranged for her to be uh, actually somebody's au pair because she was pretty young. She could be the, officially get a year's visa as an au pair. She came here as an au pair for a year after her initial visit. We had become uh, intimate. And uh, after we were four or five years together, we decided to make children. And um, right now at my ripe old age of 75, I have two beautiful little girls three and a half years old and right now I need to go and give them a <laughs> bath and put them to bed you know? <laughs> so this is a very beautiful feels like a very beautiful way to spend my old age actually with mm -hmm. these little girls and um, there's deep love between us and um, I hope they're still running around and I'll put them into bed now mm. Mm. <laughs>